<clears throat> you haven't heard what I was going to say yet. You may go, oh man, what's I got? To... Uh, greetings, Earthers. It's good to speak. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you. It's good to be able to speak with you. <clears throat> uh, we're going to talk about a variety of things. I was a little apprehensive when uh, I was invited to do this because I'm thinking, you know, the only real interest I have in plants is how they affect things with spinal columns. But that's another matter. Uh, so I thought, well, I'll do them the best I can. Uh, I've got a little bit of plant stuff in here, but I got a little bit of other stuff as well. So hopefully it'll be an interesting ride for you to say the least. Audubon, Texas. Question, uh, is there anybody here that uh, is a member of the Houston Audubon Society? Whoa, whoa, that's really good. Congratulations and thank you very much. Uh, is there anybody here who's ever even heard of Audubon, Texas? Uh, that's kind of what I was afraid of. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it's a fact. We've been around for quite a while, for years and years and years and years. But honestly, a lot of the emphasis has been up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They've got some nature centers up there and so forth. And, and uh, what I wanted to do is talk to you a little bit about Audubon, Audubon, Texas, et cetera. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. You got to understand that I am technologically dumb. Uh, and I'm probably going to fumble around with this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Audubon, Texas Coastal Program because that's kind of what I am. Uh, I worked for Parks and Wildlife for 30 years and it started getting weird. Either that or I started getting weird. I'm not sure which. But so I retired. My wife said, well, you can't really retire until you die. So I found another <laughs> She didn't want me around. Uh, so I found a job with, uh, with Audubon, Texas, and I function as their coastal warden. Um, this normally, this is a, an anomaly here. You see a man standing there with an egg in his hands. Every time I see that, I gasp. Because what are you doing holding an, an egg of one of our birds? You need to leave them the heck alone, but be that as it may. Uh, Audubon, Texas beginnings. I want to talk to you a little bit about Audubon in general and Audubon, Texas. Uh, and then I'll get on into the meat of the matter. But this is how it all started, right there, ladies' fashion. And now the Easter hat. Notice that all these, and you guys probably already know this stuff, but look at those feathers. Ooh, wee, aren't those pretty? And look over here, $32 an ounce. I like to ask people, <clears throat> uh, you know, we don't have any gold mines along the coast from Florida, from the Carolinas, all the way around the tip of Florida, all the way to Brownsville and beyond. There's no gold mines here. No, there's not. But there was something here that was worth just as much as gold. You see, because early on, gold, the price of gold was fixed at $32 an ounce. And that's what the feathers were worth on these birds as well. So, in a way, it's hard to get angry with those people that were hard scrabble lives trying to get by, and there's gold that can be mined. It's cruel, it's heartless, but nevertheless, as long as there was a demand, they were going to uh, do what they could. Here's another look at uh, the latest patterns from Paris. One thing that the hats, they were styles, and every year the fashion would change, and, but they'd all have the egret plumes. Sometimes, look, there's a whole wing of a bird surrounded by plumes, or I think that's a whole bird there. Uh, one of the things that they had in common every year were those fancy, fancy plumes. Uh, one year the fashion was, I don't remember whether it was 1895, 94, something like that. It was fashionable to have those feathers, but also little stuffed kitten heads on the hats as well. Go figure. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it was true. I don't remember what year it was, but that was the fashion. One year is to have little kitten heads surrounded by uh, beautiful uh, bird feathers. 
So the millinery trade really drove the demand for bird feathers of all kinds. When it, typically when you think of all these birds that got killed, you think about the herons and the egrets and the big plumes. Well, uh, some years the fashion was going to be blue feathers. So you'd kill uh, blue grosbeaks and indigo buntings that year. The next year it might be uh, red feathers. So there goes the carlets, the cardinals and the scarlet tanagers, etc. So it wasn't just the birds that we think of with the big fancy feathers. They were always in demand. Those feathers could be dyed, but the little birds were in demand as well. Uh, the plumes here says $400 a pound. I disagree with that. I think they were uh, $32 an ounce and that's it's a little bit more than $400 a pound. But um, really things got going in Texas starting around the 1860s and we pretty much had it shut down by, by 1907. But they were using the meat, the eggs, the skins, the, the oil, um, birds as pets. It's part of the reason the Carolina parakeet disappeared is the ones that weren't shot for predating the orchards uh, were kept as, um, as pets in cages. Here's another look at some really pretty hats. They're beautiful, and I'm sure they were very expensive. But there we go. So much for the guilt trip. I think I'm just about done. I got one more picture. There we go. These are little budgies. Little stuffed budgies on a hat. I'll give you some kind of an idea of how they used uh, not just the big birds, but also the, the little dicky birds as well. Look at that. Look at that one, boy. That is. She'd be styling, huh? I'm telling you. Okay. So people were aware of what finally became aware of what the heck was going on, and the Audubon Society was created, I think it was in Massachusetts, of all places. Well, no, that kind of makes sense in a way. But uh, they started boycotts and tea parties. Who knows, maybe that's what, if people are really concerned about plastic, maybe they need to quit using plastic. Hello? But that's another matter. I'm sorry if I wax, too, I get too far off field. But they, uh, they named the, uh, the organization after John James Audubon, uh, one of the great bird killers of uh, U.S. history. <laughs> Uh, which brings me to another point. I want you to do something for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal my own thunder, but I want, I want you to do something for me. Search, Google search sometime for fun, carbonated warbler. Carbonated warbler. You see, John James Audubon was the only person that ever saw this bird. Now, he either, either completely decimated that species or he made it up, and nobody knows which. But it wouldn't, if he comes, if he's covered in the same cloth I, I am, he is likely as not make it up. But that, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I could tell you some stories. I'm the, okay, in March 1st, 1899, the Independent Audubon Society was created in Galveston, Texas. And look at the ladies who created it. Estelle Hertford, President 23, Cecile Sexius, Secretary 15. Cecile was killed in the great storm, along with her mom. And honestly, nobody knows exactly what happened to Estelle. She was there, and she was probably killed in the storm as well. So there went Audubon, Texas in 1899. But they got it started. Guess where the next Audubon society was in Texas? Laporte. The city of Laporte, Adela Penfield, formed an Audubon Society in Texas. And look at the officers there. Millie Lamb, 16, was president. And Hope Terhune, 15, was secretary. And then uh, there's kind of uh, petered away. And then uh, everybody kind of got earnest in Waco <coughs> in 1904. Uh, but that's kind of the beginnings, the, the, the roots, if you will, of, of the National Audubon, Audubon in Texas. Uh, that's some stuff that you wouldn't get under any other circumstances. But the hue and outcry uh, started the Lacey Act, which meant it was illegal to transport them in 1903, thanks to the Audubon societies. Uh, the refuge was created. In 1907, we got game wardens for the first time. 
there were people that would actually go and say, no, you're killing too many birds or you can't do this or that. And then the Migratory Bird Act um, is what protects the birds uh, the way we, we see and know it today. It gets better. Uh, Guy Bradley was a game warden, uh, not a game warden, a, a bird warden for Audubon Society in Florida, Cape Sable area. And he was instrumental in keeping the poachers off the birds, but he met his end. He paid the ultimate price in 1905 uh, when uh, Mr. Walter Smith actually uh, killed him. And uh, they found him 10 miles away drifting in his boat uh, from the scene of the crime, and he'd bled to death. So he gave his, his, he gave his life protecting birds, and something to be said for that. I'm, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Who knows? Maybe I will. But these days and times, it's not as... Uh, people aren't going to go that far as far as taking somebody's life over protecting or taking a bird. At least I hope not. If I have to, that's where we'll go. And this is what Audubon, uh, National Audubon Society looks like right now. All these little dots that are really kind of hard to see here. Look at California. Ooh, they're full of them. Those are all National Audubon sites. Some of them are state offices, Audubon chapters, Audubon centers, and then global sites. And uh, over here is uh, the Central Flyway, which is what we're in. But honestly, the Mississippi Flyway is just right next door to that. And, and we could probably get a lot of birds from it as well. But right here along the Texas coast is uh, where we do our business. And these are, this is my stomping grounds. I don't know if any of you are familiar but with the Galveston area, but this is the causeway going from the mainland to the island. This is off its bayou. This is Tiki Island. It's a really large subdivision with uh, lots of nice houses on it. And right here, I call this one Gull Island because uh, during the breeding season, it'll probably have between six and 10,000 uh, laughing gulls on it breeding. This is called mile marker 52 because if you're coming down the intercoastal waterway, which goes this way or that way, <laughs> uh, this, there's a sign there that says mile marker MM52, mile marker 52. This is North Deer Island. It's uh, jointly shared with the Houston Audubon Society in Audubon, Texas. Uh, depending on how you want to measure it, it's uh, 165 to 230 or so acres. Uh, there's a big kind of a lagoon right here. I don't know if you see the little bar or breakwater. And then there's some water in there. And this thing is full of birds. Uh, over here is uh, Jigsaw Island. And then over here is Struvy Lucy. I don't don't ask me how it would get a name like Struvy Lucy. I have no idea. But this is one of the areas that I'm responsible for. And I spend a lot of time on the bay, weather permitting, uh, going from... from Question? Who owns those islands? Technically, uh, some of them are privately owned. For example, oops, oops, sorry. For example, this island here, uh, South Deer Island, is privately owned. Uh, these islands here are pretty much main, are owned or shared by uh, the general land office, typically. And then what they're done is they're leased. Maybe lease is not loaned. I don't know. I don't think they pay money to, for us to manage these islands for them. But uh, the GLO gives us permission to manage uh, these islands, your general land office primarily. Uh, there's another location where there's one that actually belongs to Texas Parks and Wildlife. And because they're stretched so thin, we spend a lot of time uh, helping them out. As a matter of fact, this is it right here. This is Bird Island down near San Luis Pass. Uh, where a lot of people get killed because the currents are so strange uh, down there. Uh, this is uh, West Bay Bird Island, and then right over here is TPWD Island, and then you have this big bank here. Uh, this, fall, uh, this summer, I went over here and was counting birds. Counting birds is a lot of fun, especially when there's hundreds, if not thousands of them. It's quite, it's quite an endeavor. <clears throat> but I had 150 skimmers that were nesting right there on the edge of that island. And I came back two weeks later <clears throat> and saw a lady out here, right in this flat here, with her cast net. She was throwing her cast net out. And uh, before I saw her, I went over and was saying, 
where did all my skimmers go? They were nesting here. Now there's not a single skimmer there at all. Well, I'm not saying that this lady was responsible for those skimmers disappearing in the middle of nesting season, but I went over and had a chat with her and uh, said, you know, you really shouldn't do this and here's why and blah, blah, blah. It was, it was a friendly enough uh, session, but you know, at the same time I had to be a little, in the event that you ever have a, you feel compelled to make a contact with somebody who's doing something really stupid, these are some things that you should remember. The first thing you do is don't go, what the heck do you think you're doing? <laughs> Wrong. First go up and say, hi, hello, how are you? You doing okay today? Oh, by the way, did you know that the, you know, what you're doing is wrong or what you're doing could get you in trouble? And then uh, two things are gonna happen. They're gonna go, oh no, I didn't know that, okay. Yeah, and then, you, and then you've educated that person. Good on you. And then you're gonna have those few that are gonna say, who the hell do you think you are? Go take a flying leap. And that's when I always use the silver bullet. Well, you leave me alter no alternative. I'm going to have to go and report you. Now, that's all you have to say. Then you leave, and they're not going to stop the behavior while you're there. But I guarantee you, as soon as you're out of sight, they're out of there too, because they don't want they don't want to have to to go through that. So there's the silver bullet. But <clears throat> in, uh, something interesting is happening. Uh, has anybody ever heard of climate change? <laughs> huh? Yeah, you, yeah, apparently you have. Nobody said, yeah, but the, the <laughs> laugh kind of might imply that you have. Uh, we have a plant on the Texas coast that a lot of people don't realize. And that plant is called a black mangrove. A mangrove. A lot of people don't know that mangroves actually exist here in Texas. Well, the black mangrove does. It doesn't really get big like the red mangroves we typically think of when we think of mangrove forests like you'd have in far south Florida, but the black mangrove is getting a foothold on some of these islands. The reason they're getting a foothold in these islands is there were always a few of them here and there scattered around the upper Texas coast, but the, but the, the cold weather always burnt them back. So they never could really get a head of steam going. Well, guess what? This island is completely, completely black mangrove. Texas A&M University Galveston says that within 100 years, if we proceed the way we are, I'm not trying to scare you, uh, but in 100 years, I guess this all be underwater anyway if you go by the climate thing. But be that as it may, in 100 years, all the salt marshes in Texas will be gone and they'll be replaced with black mangrove. So that's gonna be interesting to watch or plot, as it were, but that's black mangrove. Oh, and it's neither here nor there, but I got stuck right out there one night. It was January the 19th, uh, 2017. Got to spend the night out there on the boat. You see all these little areas here, they're super shallow. The water's maybe six or eight inches up. And I thought I was in this channel here. Wrong. So I went to what's called plane on the boat and I brought it up to speed so I could plane and I ran right out into this flat in about six inches of water and scooted up in it about 300 yards, 300 feet, and I was stuck like Chuck. There's no way I was getting out that night. So I got to wait until the sun came up the next morning and the tide came up as well and I floated myself off, but it was an interesting experience. Very humbling as well. Uh, this is Rollover Pass. Rollover Pass used to have quite a few islands on it, but the but what happens is this is the intercoastal canal, and when the big barges come through here, they push these big wakes up against these islands, and, it, and it's eroding them pretty quickly. These islands here, right here, are primarily for what I refer to as loafing. It's where the birds just, they need to get away from the wife and kids, or they need to get away from the husband and the kids, so they go over to these islands and they hang out for a while, and, the, and I call it loafing. Uh, this island here is the only one that really I have any birds nesting on it. Primarily they're right here. Oop, primarily here there's uh, uh, snowy egrets, uh, white ibis, a uh, few uh, little blues, and so on. Uh, but that's the only one out of all these. They're talking about plug and roll over pass, which means that that'll be sealed off. I don't know what that's going to do. 
uh, to the bird life there. I it may improve it, it may not, but it's way beyond me. Way beyond me. Rollover Pass is another one of my stomping grounds. This is the Van Toon Islands. It's Vinktet Un, it's somehow it's French. Uh, it means 21. Uh, and if you count, there's not 21 islands there anymore. And originally, they were 21, and they were full of birds. <clears throat> literally full of birds. This is where the rootstock for most of the roseate spoonbills that find their, found their way into zoos around the world came from, is the Van Toon Islands in Texas. If you went to Paris and you saw a spoonbill, I'm not saying you could, but this is where they came from, Van Toon. Uh, the Van Toon Islands now are uh, just little barren strips. The tides and uh, the erosion has, has taken its toll on them. You see this island right here? That island ought to be full of birds. You can tell because of the green, it's, got, it's covered in vegetation. But there's not a single bird nesting there. There's a few uh, skimmers and terns that nest on these little barrier islands. But if we get a big blow, it swamps the islands and they're gone. And I'm wondering, what's going on here? I think these birds are nesting inland, but I have yet to find out why and where. So there's another one of my stomping grounds. <clears throat> This is mile marker 52. Um, it's kind of this part of it and that's part of it. And uh, this is full of pelicans and uh, uh, you name it. This is a little oyster reef. It's a little tricky getting in here, to say the least, but can be done. There's North Deer Island. Uh, this is, you can see these from the causeway, by the way. If you look over uh, back behind Tiki Island, you'll see these guys. But you see this big lagoon here? I was out walking this area here looking at vegetation and, and it was kind of early in the season before the birds really started nesting. And so uh, I was looking for scrapes that uh, American oyster catchers would make. They don't build a nest with vegetation. They just make a little hollow in the, in the shells that are deposited on the side. And I'm, okay, it's deer, North Deer Island, right? So I'm walking along and I'm kind of looking around watching for rattlesnakes because they're abundant there. And I heard this it's the sound that a deer makes when he gets a whiff of a human. I don't know if you ever heard that. They get a whiff of human smell and they go, Ugh! and they, they snort that out really quick. Okay, and I heard that. I said, okay, yeah, I know. It's North Deer Island. There's no deer on this island for Pete's sake. There can't be. <laughs> heard it again. The lights came on. What I had were bottlenose dolphin blowing in this lagoon over here. It was great. What a great, they tricked me. <laughs> but then I got to watch the little, it's not real deep, it's probably at five feet at best in here, but they were in there having a, convorting and having a grand old time. So <laughs> North Deer Island. Really wish that I could get you guys out there with me sometime. Uh, granted, I can't get a, carry a lot of you on my boat. I call it the skimmer, and it can travel in about five or six, six inches of water. But if you ever come with me, you got to be prepared to haul off the boat and let the boat float a little bit and we'll push it off the sandbar or off the little oyster reef that, we're, that we've nudged ourselves up on and then we pile back on the boat and we go on our merry way. But uh, that just kind of comes with the territory. But that's, uh, that's my boat and that's what I drive. I really do have some plant stuff in here, guys. I really do. <laughs> Here's a look at... Uh, at the boat, uh, uh, this is my, there's, in the distance there is North Deer Island, and then right over here is uh, mile marker 52. This is the intercoastal waterway. I'm anchored there, and sometimes this is as close as you can get, and you have to, if you're gonna get on the island, you have to kinda slide off into the water and wade to the island, and hope, hope the boat's there when you get back. No, I'm just kidding, it, you, you, sort of. <laughs> Uh, this is mile marker 52, and this is kind of what a lot of the islands look like. You see, you got this little shell spoil here. You can see where the tides come up and up and up. Uh, the, the oyster catchers and some of the gulls and such are going to be nesting in these areas. But you can see if we had a big blow, they're gone. Now start over if they're lucky. Uh, right here we have some prickly pear cactus. And... Uh, they're fairly abundant on a lot of these islands. The islands that have any vegetation on them at all uh, are generally gonna have prickly pear. Back here in the distance, we have uh, uh, red mulberry, uh, some wesatch, and ratama. 
uh, gives us some, and uh, hackberry, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those in a little while. But, mulberry? I'm sorry? Mulberry? Red mulberry. Yeah. The, the, the little, what I refer to as dicky birds, the little passerines, will eat the mulberries and then they'll fly over these islands and they'll poop, poop the, the berries out and then we get red mulberries. Here's another look. We actually got some elevation. Most of these islands are done for, built from spoil. I don't know that any of my, my islands, my islands, are actually natural. And you can see uh, erosion, how erosion takes place. Uh, big blows can do this. And then also uh, boats from the ICW, as they come by, uh, they can do this. If the wind's right and the wave's right and the tide's right, they can really, really uh, do a number. That looks like bushy blue stem there, almost. Uh, in another life, I was a prairie restoration manager, and that's my first love is prairies. And this is what it looks like sometimes when we're on our way to uh, do plant transects or to do some maintenance of various and sundry sorts on the islands. Is uh, That's as close as we can get, and then back up this way is going to be uh, vegetation, but you've got to slog through the mud uh, to get to them. High comedy. This is one of the projects that's going on uh, down around the Matagorda Island, Matagorda Bay area, is they have a hard time getting trees to grow on their islands. So as a result, what they do is they build these structures here for uh, birds like uh, great blue herons to nest on. Great blue herons are going to use these first because they, they, great blue herons start nesting February, early February. So they're already working on these. When they're finished with them, then you might get uh, uh, great egrets or some other bird using those. But generally, these structures are, are for great blue herons. You can see some Johnson grass here in the, in the foreground. And then the, the, if you have grass on the island at all, it's generally Bermuda, Bermuda grass. But you wouldn't even recognize it as Bermuda. It's so big. And there's another look at one of the structures. We can accommodate one, two, three, four, five, five nesting birds. There's five pair nesting on those, those structures. All that has to be hauled out there and then assembled on site. Uh, it's kind of fun, though. On some of the islands, the ones down in Matagora, as I was telling you, they have a hard time getting some big vegetation to grow on them. So I almost had a heart attack when they told me that they were planting bacchus on these islands. <laughs> I'm a prairie manager and I don't like the term bacchus at all. I mean, that's one of the banes of my existence. Uh, and so for them to be planting bacchus on these islands was just almost beyond my comprehension. But I thought, well, okay, you know, if it works, if it's stupid, but it works, it ain't stupid. Murphy's Law of Combat. But uh, what they did is they plant these seedlings in there and then they put a stake, a bamboo stake beside it, and then they wrap it in these plastic uh, things that hopefully will prevent the birds from trying to nest right on top of one. Oh, look, there's a, a backers plant. I could probably build a nest in the top of this little seedling. <laughs> now, what it is is to give these seedlings a little bit of a head start before the birds actually start to destroy them in the process of nesting. So, uh, the islands look kind of funny. This is a, a look at North Deer Island when it's uh, ginning. Uh, just that one island, we counted 6,000 nesting pair of brown pelican wow. this year. On that one island, 6,000 nesting pair. So that's a lot of birds. And uh, you can see these guys are doing what I was telling you. They're loafing. Uh, but what you have here, it, pr primarily oh, you'll see pelicans, but there's every kind of wading bird you can think of. Uh, roseate spoonbills, white ibis, occasionally uh, white-faced ibis, uh, roseate spoonbills, little blue herons, tricolored herons. Uh, they're all there. Now, I will tell you this, I'm concerned because the pelicans are doing so well, I think they're starting to squeeze the wading birds off these islands. What's up with that? 
Well, I think that, that before the pelicans left, that's probably the way it was. I think a lot of the wading birds, herons and egrets, nested a little bit more on the freshwater side, on the mainland where you had lakes and bodies of water, swamps, if you will. And I think that what's going to happen is they're going to get pushed back to those areas as pelican populations begin to recover fully. The catch is those places, those freshwater sites aren't there anymore. Aren't there anymore. Is vegetation important? A little uh, ornithology on you here. Not too much, though, I promise. Uh, yeah, it is, uh, because some of the birds on these islands, we'll talk about that in a minute, but you have different, various sundry kinds of nests, and you can tell where the birds are on the evolutionary ladder, depending on the kind of nest they make. Um, but uh, the ground nesters are guys who really kind of low on the pole, uh, because their nests are just what they are. Uh, trivia, you probably already know the answer. You ever seen a, an owl's egg? It's perfectly round. A uh, yeah, uh, black belly whistling duck nests in a hole, perfectly round, also white. A uh, uh, killdeer egg, it's pointed. How come? So if it rolls, it rolls in a circle instead of rolling away because they nest on the ground. Uh, all these kinds of things drive uh, where birds nest and why they nest the way they do. Who'd have thunk this was Native Plant Society yeah, was talking about birds? Uh, vegetation requirements uh, depends on the bird species, uh, the wise about where they build. They build on bare ground, bushes, shrubs, trees, and grasses. Do you know the difference between a bush, a shrub, and a tree? A tree, you have to walk around. A shrub, you can step through. In a bush, you step over. <laughs> Just thought you'd like to know. <laughs> Nest timing cycles. These birds use these islands and use the, the, the same vegetation at different times. They stagger when they make their babies, so there's not, a whole, not any more competition than there really has to be on these islands. And let me tell you, those trees that once they get established really get a workout on those islands. Uh, we're going to talk about what kind of trees you might expect to see there in just a minute. But uh, they have to protect their, their uh, nest sites and, and these group communal collective sites help do that. But here's a pop quiz for you and you never get the answer to this one. You see this, all this leaf litter here? And then there's two eggs in the center of it. Anyone want to venture a guess as to what kind of eggs those are? I'll tell you, since you could guess forever, they're turkey vulture eggs. Oh, wow. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have thunk it? When I was a, a fledgling ornithologist of about nine or ten years old, growing up on the coastal prairies of Texas, I wanted to get myself a pet vulture. And so what I would do is I would lay out on the prairie and hold my breath. <laughs> And when the vulture came, the vulture came to eat me, pick my eyes out and then eat me. I was going to grab him by the leg. And, but either I would fall asleep or I would get bored and I never got to catch one. In hindsight, that was probably a good thing because I would have never been able to explain to my mom why I had vulture puke all over me. <laughs> because that's the first thing that's going to happen. When you grab a vulture, he's going to puke on you. So uh, it's probably a good thing that didn't happen. Uh, Audubon seasons, we have two seasons. I have the breeding season and I have the non-breeding season. Uh, during the breeding season, I don't get on the islands. For, for I can't hardly conceive of a reason why I need to get on there and disturb those birds. Not even to get my picture taken. Hey, look, I'm on the aisle. See all these birds? Look at all these abandoned nests. You get on the island, the bird leaves the, the, the uh, egg, the egg's unattended, gets too much sun, gets not enough sun, doesn't get turned, gets predated. All kinds of bad things can happen. When you put your behind on those islands, just stay off of them. I mean, I do that for a living, if you will. I don't get on them. There's no good reason to. 
So, so much for the lecture there. Uh, during the non-breeding season, then I do maintenance inspection. I go out there and try to control fire ants because they're there. They've gotten there a long, way ahead of me on rafts as they do. And I try to control them with a, with a growth inhibiting hormone, Amdro. Uh, what are you gonna do? I don't know whether that's good or bad, but um, I'd like to give the birds a little bit of an edge if I can. Uh, we build structures. Uh, we plant plants on the island in some cases and uh, just generally survey them. I've got, we've got some people now, some teams that are going out there and they're doing vegetative transects across the islands so we know what we have where at different elevations. Uh, I wish I had their information. They could tell you a lot more about the plants uh, than I can right now. But moving right along. Okay, move along. Oh, come back here. This is uh, Struvy Lucy. You can see the causeway in the distance. And then this is Struvy Lucy. Uh, look at the little patch of vegetation there. That's about the only area under certain circumstances that's it's not underwater. These areas here are oyster flats, uh, but you can see because of the color, they've just recently been dried out. So the tide's affecting these. And then normal tides are gonna be in this area here. And then when we get a blow, it comes right up to the green. Uh, this island here is, uh, is good for skimmers. They like it and also gulls and, and Caspian and Royal Terns. Uh, don't get any of the big waders there because they need trees and such to nest in. Some vegetation found on the nesting islands. We're gonna go through the, you wanna do a quiz when I pop something. No, I actually, I put the names on them. Bang. I was gonna say, we could get you to see how you guys can identify these. But here we go. Arundinaria gigantea is, a, is the giant cane that uh, grows along the river bottoms of, of Texas. You gotta, if you could go back 250 years, if you, it, the cane breaks were extended out probably 20 or two or three miles from the river bottoms, and they, they would stretch for 50 or 60 miles up and down. And what it was was under the canopy of the big trees, you had this. Arundinaria, it's one of my favorite things. I love it. It's almost gone. And you go to the river bottoms now, you'll be hard pressed to find Arundinaria gigantic. I think it's 20 feet tall. But uh, the cattle really like it. And when you run a fire through those bottoms, and it burns all this down, those new shoots start coming up. It's great stuff. It uh, goes through about a seven year cycle. Uh, the, uh, it's, it grows by rhizomes, but but about every seven years, it actually produces a seed, and then it dies, and it starts up somewhere else. Neat stuff. Found it on the islands. How in the world did it get to those islands? Washed down the rivers. Some remnant washed down the rivers and got stuck on one of my little islands. It's great. I love it. Bermuda grass. Well, not all. There's Bacris, <laughs> sage of my, bane of my existence, and then there's some Bermuda grass. Uh, a, the birds will tear this up. I mean, okay, it's like, you know, three feet tall. I'm going to nest on that, you know. I mean, that's up off the ground. That's a, that's a shrub. I could walk through that. Couldn't, yeah, I couldn't step over it. I, yeah, that's a shrub. Brazilian pepper. Anybody familiar with this guy? Don't be. It's bad, bad news. <clears throat> it's got a foothold in Texas, and it could... It, it has the potential for make, at least in the temperate areas, for making the Chinese tala tree look like a piker. Uh, this one is on mile marker 52. I need to go over there and pull it up, but I just haven't done it yet. Hopefully this, it's an accident. I'm hoping it is. Carolina wolfberry. I see these blue flowers and I don't think Carolina wolfberry because wolfberries are red. So every time I see those little pretty blue flowers on, the, on the, the islands, I'm going, what is that? And then I remember Carolina wolfberry. Those are edible for the birds and such. I've never tried one, but, uh, but they're fairly common. You see the leaves on it are, are succulent in appearance. Is it exotic? It's not exotic, oh. no. But I don't know if it's necessarily native to Texas either. Um, but I think it might be. Uh, dewberries, um, I know there's a lot of varieties of those, but uh, 
that's one of the ground covers in, mixed in, interspersed with the Bermuda grass. We satch. Everybody knows this. We satch with the thorns. Watch out. I, I had some people calling these uh, mesquite. And I, I can kind of see why they could get them mixed up. But and nevertheless, uh, these, are the, these are one of the, the, the trees, if you will, that get some, some substance to it on the islands, how they actually survive to the point where they can get some substance is beyond me. But this will be covered in, in birds. There'll be 25 nests in that one, in that one uh, tree. And then after the season's over, there will be a bit of vegetation under it because it'll all be killed by the urates that are squirted out of those little baby bird behinds. <laughs> we have Iva. I think Iva's related to, closely related to Bacris, but it's not. Uh, it's, uh, it's some, the leaves kind of look like Bacris, but they're, they're thicker and a little more succulent in appearance. But this is what it looks like when it's flowering. And boy, doesn't that look like Bacris to you? Yeah. Yeah, it does to me too. And you know, um, you know how to tell the difference between male and female Bacris, right? The females are white and the males are yellow. So as you're driving down, the, down the, uh, the highway and you see that what used to be a prairie and now is a field of Bacris with tiny Chinese tallow growing in it, you can pick out the males and the females. Yellow, white, yellow, white, white, white. Uh, Johnson grass, uh, an invasive to say the least. It's found its way to the islands, but, but it's pretty much kept in check by a lot of the other things. Lantana, uh, the birds will actually try to build nests in this. It is amazing, <laughs> but they do. Uh, pigweed, it's one of the amaranths. There's two varieties. There's one that doesn't have thorns and there's one that does. And you put your hands on it and you'll know which one you got. Uh, they're fairly common. This will, these, uh, these inflorescences here will, will get brownish black, a really ugly little plant. Pretty obnoxious as well. Prickly pear cactus. Uh, fairly abundant on the islands. Uh, they'll build their nests right in the center of all these thorns. How they do it is beyond me. Uh, but they'll bring sticks and twigs from God knows where, and they'll pluck them in there, and they'll build nests. Uh, have you guys ever eaten prickly pear cactus tunas? A little tricky to do in the full seeds, but boy, I tell you what, on a hot summer day when you're really, really thirsty, it's better than water. Now, after you do it, your, th your fingers are going to go, ow, 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 ow. From all the little thorns. You gotta peel them because if you don't, you eat those little stickers, they'll get you. So just but be careful. But it's fun. You take a chance, live dangerously. <laughs> oh God, it's got me. Red mulberry. These these leaves really fooled me one time. I could because see they don't look the same. You know, you get all this variation, but um, but the mulberries will get uh, a pretty much substantial side size. And the thing is, is that, dang it, I wish I could go over there during the migration, the, the spring migration, and sit under one of those mulberry, no, sit a distance away from one of the mulberry trees and watch all the little uh, passerines that are going to come to it because you know they're coming. <laughs> the problem is, is it's March. And I've got a moratorium on entering the islands from February until September. So I can't go on the islands and watch them. And I can't get close enough to really see them either. Ratama, also called Palo Verde, also called Jerusalem thorn. Uh, this is a relative newcomer to this part of Texas. Uh, when I was a kid, they weren't here. Uh, they've come up from, from South Texas up here. And even the, 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 the limbs and the bark in some cases are uh, green. They, even their, their tree bark photosynthesizes for Pete's sake. Uh, they're pretty tenacious and they have thorns as well. But these are the trees that the birds would nest in. A tree like that would probably have 15, 20 nests in it. Just, just beyond pecking distance is kind of where the... Uh, Phragmites, you guys are probably familiar with Phragmites. Uh, it's a native, but it can, it can get out of control. Um, it's really occupying a lot of a couple of my islands and it's bugging me because that, that area could be used for something. The birds can't nest in that. 
you know, the big birds, the herons and the egrets, can't nest in that. But I've come up with an idea. I haven't been able to test it to, to fruition yet, but this is what I came up with. This is Phragmites. What I did was I pulled a bunch of them together and tied twine around it, and then I clipped the tops off and then inverted the tops and stuck them back down in. So what I'm making are these cones, cones out of the Phragmites, in hopes that there's some maybe mid-sized wading birds that'll use those. I did a few of them last year before I got shoved off the islands, and when I came back this year so far to check on them, I can't get to them because they're covered with vines. So I have yet to discover whether, whether that was going to work or not. But that's what I'm trying to do with the Phragmites. Other than that, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Sea oxide daisy is one of the flowers that blooms there. Real dry, real, real dry, itchy, sandpapery kind of leaves on it. And not a very attractive flower as daisies go. Sesbania rattlebox. There's two, or three, two species of... Uh, Sesbania that grow on the islands. And this is a disturbed area indicator. If you see Sesbania, like dewberries, you see those two things in an area, you pretty much uh, bet it's been messed up somehow or another. But remember, all these are spoil islands. So what do you expect? Spartina, I'm pretty sure that's alterniflora, but I, I got this thing, mental block about Spartinas. If I could get to Spartina, I'm doing well. Really, I think this is a freshwater pond, and I think that's also one of the criteria for the birds selecting these islands. Is these islands have to have a place where there's some fresh water on it, or at least brackish. And you know that Spartina has the ability to desalinate water. You guys knew that, right? Next time you go find some Spartina, and I'm not sure which one it is. I think it's our alternaflora. Look at the leaves on it, and you'll see these little white crystals. Those little white crystals are salt. You can taste them. <laughs> No, yeah, you can. You can really taste, and you can actually taste the salt. And it, what it, it's been pushed out of those leaves, so they're uh, they're desalinating the water. It's really cool. At least I think so. Sugar hackberry. There's the bark on one of the hackberry trees. That's really a bit exaggerated, but there's also the berries. You guys ever eaten the sugar hackberries? Probably growing all over Houston. See those little red berries when they get nice and dark? Grab one. And they're almost all seed. They have a real thin little skin on them. What you do is you eat the skin. And the skin's going to be really sweet. Well, some depends on the berry. But they're going to be sweet, and then you spit the seed out. Now, if you're a raccoon, what you do is you eat them all, and then you poop them out later. And you'll see those, see, you'll see those little piles of uh, yellow seeds. Yeah, look at the raccoon's got there. Well, they've been eating sugar hackberries. And I'm thinking, oh, does that look like a pear tree to you? It doesn't have a partridge in it, but does that look like a pear tree? I'm almost certain on one of my islands I have a pear tree. Now, how in the world did it get there? I don't have a clue, but I, I'm going to find out if it is indeed a pear one of these years. Oh, okay, that, that's pretty close to the last slide. And what I was going to do is I was going to invite you to, uh, to join us. I know you probably got a million irons in the fire. But if you're at all interested, you can find us at TURN. That means Texas Estuary and Resource Network. And that's what we call our volunteers. They're TURNs. And they come and they help us. This is what they do. Bird surveys, patrolling, monitoring, bird populations, that's with me on the boat, and, and then sometimes some freshwater areas, uh, restoring bird sanctuaries, litter removal, boy, we got a lot of that to do. Invasive species control, planting shrubs, uh, public outreach events, education for school kids and seniors, collecting valuable data, and so on and so on. And way down here in fine print is Carrie. Howard, and she can be reached if you're at all interested in coming and playing with us. Uh, the thing about coming with me is that it's, it's a hit or miss. It's kind of like being a fireman. You never know when the bell's going to go off. If the weather ain't right, I ain't going. If the weather changes and gets bad, I ain't going. Okay, I've been there, done that, and it ain't worth it. So that's 
all I got. I think I have one more slide. This says, thank you for listening to me. I've tried to put a little bit of plant stuff in there. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary.